you are with us. We had a great service at 915 this morning and we're ready to continue. The Lord is moving. Can you believe we are almost at the end of December? Jesus. I don't know why you're clapping, but you must be doing good. No, that's great. I'm glad to hear. Is there anybody here for the very first time? We'd like to see your hands. We'd like to bless you. We know, you know, God bless you. There you go. God bless you over there as well. Amen. God bless you over there. We welcome you to Lifeline Heart of Worship. We love to praise the Lord at full volume. Our Heart of Worship practices and they dedicate themselves and you don't know how much sacrifice they put in to be able to bring the presence of the Holy Spirit down in this place. So we are so grateful. Give it up for the Heart of Worship. Amen. Yes, and so if you're here for the first time, we, we welcome you. Our vision is simple. Healing for the body, mind, and soul. We want the Holy Spirit, the Lord, to make you holy and complete as only He can. And uh, like I said, we, we, we we're just a church that loves to praise and worship. And we are in this series called A Christmas Revolution. And uh, uh, if you have not heard part one and part two, you might want to do that. It is on our Lifeline app. It is on the Bible app. Actually, it's on the Lifeline app and it's on YouTube as well. And you can catch that uh, just to kind of catch up. They're not all connected, but they all uh, will bless your life if you go back and listen to them. And, and so again, so we've been in this series, and it's been a blessing. I want to thank Dr. McCutcheon, who did a great job last week talking about the Holy Spirit. That was powerful. And so we're going to get right into the Word. If you're ready, I'm ready. Are you ready? Luke 9 and 23, it'll be on your screen. It'll be on your screen, it'll be on your Lifeline app, it'll be on your Bible app if you have that as well. Watch what it says, help me preach this morning. It says, then he said to the crowd, if any of you what? Wants to be my, you must give up your own, take up your what? Monthly? Weekly? Yearly? Okay, guys, I'm just, just like you're yelling at me, making sure you got it. And it says what? And? follow me. Great job, church. We thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for what you did at 915. We're grateful for what you're about to do right now at 11. So take control of this service. Your presence is already in this place. Permeate through the hardest heart, Father God. Break the hardest heart and mend the broken heart, Father. Let us listen to your word. Let us be able to take it in and apply it, Father God. For the word of God is nothing until we apply it. It's when it comes to life. So we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your spirit. Holy Spirit, we lift up all those that continue to give faithfully to this ministry. You know who they are. We bless them, Lord. It allows us to continue. It allows us to be mobile. It allows us to do the things that we do in ministry. We bless them, but not because I say, but because it is written in your word. But now, Holy Spirit, this is the time of your people. This is the, the sermon that you gave me to give to them. So I ask you, Holy Spirit, speak through me so that I can speak to them. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. With somebody shout. Amen. Would you touch two or three people and say, hey, I'm glad you made it to church today. How are you doing right there? If you're watching us online, we welcome you. God bless you. Do us a favor. Drop us a comment below where you're listening from. And do us a favor and share this on your page so we can get the word of God out to as many people as possible. Amen. Get comfortable. Get situated. We'll let everybody get situated there. Yes, this series has been a blessing, and um, when we get into uh, Luke 9, 23, he says, he said to the crowd, if anyone wants to, wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Another version says, you must, you must give up your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. <clears throat> Part one, I, I talked about the Mincha offering. If you were here, you know what I'm talking about in that. Take some time to listen to it. I talked about the Mincha offering and how, you know, what do you offer, you know, this is Christmas season, and, and this is a time when we offer Christ. We're, you know, we're supposed to bring him gifts. We're, we're not, he's not supposed to give us something. We're supposed to give him something. And I, and I said, what do you give a God that is a creator of everything and owns everything? I mean, what do you, what do you give somebody like that? And we talked about the Mincha offering, which is a sacrifice praise. And, and, and really, when you think about it before that, I mean, what else? 
could we give the creator of everything? What else could we give the God that has everything? And when you stop to think about it, it's not really a trick question. It's actually something that, that, that I think we, sh we should really think about, and that's us. I mean, think about it. If Jesus was here walking on the earth today, he wouldn't be asking for a house or a car. Wouldn't be anything. He'd be asking for you. Amen? I mean, he, that's probably the best gift that we could give the Lord is ourselves, is our selfless time, our sacrifice, our, 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 our dedication to follow him, as the scripture says. And when you read the scripture, it says, it says whoever wants to, to follow me, it says, it says, if you want to be my follower, it says, if you want to be my follower, that if is such a big if, it says, what, what must I do? It says, I must give up my ways, I must take up my cross, we already said it, not weekly, not monthly, not yearly, but daily and then, it says, then follow him and now we read this verse and it seems really simple to understand and it seems really clear to understand and, and to be honest with you it, it, there's no hidden messages there's it, it's clear but what the truth of the matter is it's not easy true it's not easy to follow Christ I mean if it, if it was I mean I think these sanctuaries are all over the United States would be fulfilled you know it, but it's not it's hard to follow Jesus in fact I, 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 I did something I wanted to show you an illustration just to kind of I mean, this, this scripture is talking spiritually, you know, hey, if you really want to be my follower, give up your, your own way, take up your cross daily and follow me. But imagine if it was literally, now I didn't get, um, thank you, I didn't get a bigger cross for the sake of just not getting hurt, but, but I brought this baby with me. Can you imagine if, if we took this verse literally, like if you went to work like this, like, can you imagine everywhere you went, you went to work and, and your boss is looking at you like, what, 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 what the hell are you doing? And you're like, I have to take up my cross today. Just relax, boss. You're going to be blessed by me doing this. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine when you get it in your car and you're trying to put your seatbelt on? I mean, look how hard I'm having just to kind of balance it. You know, some of you would try to hang it around your neck, but you'd be kind of foolish. But you can just imagine what, what, what you know, it, it'd be like, oh my God, are you serious? Like, like really? Just everywhere you go, you know, here comes the cross and... You know, it, it can get, imagine, you know, you, it's time for lunch. Hey, where do you want to go? Uh, Subway. Are you bringing that cross with you? Because if you are, I'm not coming with you. You know, you kind of look foolish to walk it. But when you think about the scripture, think about it if we took it literally. And if, if, if I told you today, everybody that leaves today out of this sanctuary is going to take one of these home. You'd be like, I ain't coming to this church ever again. But, but, but the truth of the matter is, imagine if we did do that literally. Imagine that it would take you, uh, uh, you would really struggle to sin. It, it actually catch you. I mean, it, this thing's like literally staring right at you. Like right before you try to steal something, right before you try to post something you shouldn't, right before you try to say something that you shouldn't, right before you try to do something that you shouldn't, this thing's looking right at you like, really, you're going to do it? Right? I mean, it would literally pretty much keep us in check. Right, because it's a visual statement of what Jesus Christ did for us. I mean, like literally, like this wooden thing like would keep me from doing stuff. Can you imagine? And so he's not telling us to do that, of course, uh, 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 literally. He's telling us to do it spiritually. But for the sake of sermon, I'm going to put it right here so you can stare at you. You imagine that. That would be something. Give him my way, take my cross daily and follow me. And again... Simple scripture in the sense of it's, there's nothing hidden in there. It's pretty clear to the point. But how many of us, number one, have a hard time following? And number two, how many of us want to take a lead? And so all of a sudden, yeah, God, I'll follow you. I'm all in, whatever the case. But all, all you know, things are going great and dandy. And all of a sudden, you're like, I got this, Lord. Just kind of take a back seat and I'll tell you where to go. Just follow me, Lord. And the Lord never said that he would follow you. It says that we should follow him. In fact, wouldn't you go to the one that died on the cross and already defeated death? I would rather follow someone that's already been through death, resurrected and is alive, than to just, just try to think that I have my own ways. He says, I got this. Just follow me. But I know it's really hard sometimes, church, and I know sometimes it's very difficult. And so sometimes, like I said, we'd like to take the lead. We'd like to take the lead. And so in the story that we're going to read today it is a story that... that that believe it or not, this is actually the first time I actually preach on the story. I was kind of doing research right now in the back. And I'm like, I've never preached on the story before. And the reason why I never preached on it is because I really didn't understand it. I didn't understand it. I said, Lord, you know, I understand your scripture, but it, it almost seems that when I read this story and I, and I read the verse that we just read, you know, if you're my servant, follow me. It almost seems like it contradicts the verse. 
And there are people that will tell you, oh, yeah, that's why I don't read the Word of God because it contradicts itself. The Bible does not contradict itself. You have to read it in context and put yourself in that place and understand their time to understand it. If you don't understand it, you'll easily say, oh, no, it's just contradicting itself. And it's not contradicting itself. But when I saw it, it looked like it was contradicting itself. Because I didn't understand how, as we'll read right now, that we would read the story and Jesus in this story, he seems so insensitive. He seems so cold-hearted. He seems so rude. I mean, that, that just doesn't, doesn't kind of, doesn't, doesn't work with me. It doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't feel right. So I've actually subtitled today's sermon, Follow Me. Somebody say, follow me. Follow me. Now, not follow me, follow him, but I'm just telling you, it's follow me. And, 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 and this is the reason why, church, this is the reason why it's not good enough it's not enough just to just read a verse. Oh, I read the verse. Wow, great. No, we must study the verse. Study the verse. And I know I'm not going to get a lot of amens on that because, Pastor, I don't really have time to study. Yeah, but you'd be surprised how many life lessons you would learn from a scripture that you can pull out and you would, serve, you, would, you would avoid so many hardships. You would avoid so many pit stops. You would avoid so many pitfalls. You would avoid so many issues if you would actually get the word studied. So when you come up to that pitfall, you become to that, to that breakdown, actually becomes a breakthrough because you know exactly what you got to do in Jesus' name. Amen. So we read the story today. It's in Luke 9, 57 and 62. And this is the one I had questions about. So just stay with me. As they were walking along the road, watch what it says. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. He's talking to Jesus. Verse 58, Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests. He goes, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Verse 59 says, another man came by and he says, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go bury my father. And the scripture says, let the dead, Jesus answered, let the dead bury the own dead. It says, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another man came, another one said, and said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied in verse 62, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. So we see these three scriptures. And, and again, if you just read it right off the bat, you're like, wait, what? You have three men here that want to follow him, yet Jesus seems to be rejecting them. In fact, being really kind of almost rude to the second guy, let the dead bury the dead. Kind of seems kind of odd. But you got to understand something that, that, I mean, I don't know about you, but when I'm reading scripture and I'm prepared, I, ask, I like to ask the Lord, what do you mean and why? It's why we get revelation. It's why we ask the Lord for revelation. And so I see this, and it seems a bit harsh. Why would he reject it? The first one says, I will follow you. The second one says, let me go bury my dad. And the third one says, let me go say goodbye to my family. In fact, if I would go deeper, what puts this scripture kind of up there to, to, to kind of really just say, okay, well, what's really going on here? It's like when you go to John 1, the Bible said that Philip was doing his thing, and Jesus came up to Philip, and he said, Philip. He said, follow me. Philip got up and followed him. Bible says in Matthew, uh, uh, Matthew 9, 9, that Jesus was walking around there, there with all these tax collectors and he looked at Matthew and he saw Matthew and he said, Matthew, drop everything you're doing, Matthew, and follow me. The Bible says that right there in the moment of work, Matthew, a tax collector, an IRS agent, stopped what he was doing, didn't give his two weeks notice and began to follow Jesus. We go to another scripture that we read uh, uh, in, Ma in Mark 1, 7, where it says that Peter and Andrew were fishing. They were fishing. They were going to, you know, they're doing their thing. Dude, that's what they did for a living. And the Bible says, he says, hey, hey, guys, Peter, Andrew, he says, drop what you're doing and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So we begin to see a pattern with Matthew. We begin to see a pattern with Philip, with, with, with Peter and Andrew, and so many more. In fact, if you went to John 10, 27, the Bible says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they what? Follow me. Notice, notice, my sheep listen to my voice. That's why not everybody's here, because we have a lot of, we don't have a lot of sheep. We have a lot of sheep. We're not, everybody's kind of like a ram doing their own thing. But it says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. If you continue just two chapters later, John 12, 26 says, whoever serves me doesn't say should. It says must follow me. So I've given you four or five different scriptures of examples that it seems to be that Jesus' favorite phrase is follow me. I mean, it, it, just, it just showed you. It just seems very you know, simple to understand, it's right there in front of us. But yet here in Luke 9, we have three men who are willing to do just that. 
and Jesus rejects them. So I have to ask why. I have to ask why because it doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, who were these men? Why did they get rejected? What happened? What did they do that was so wrong? What was wrong with them that Jesus didn't want them to follow him? Huh. And so I went back, like I said, and I studied and I cross-referenced and I actually went through the four Gospels and I began to try to compare because if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you read the stories in the same but different perspectives. Luke's a physician, so you get it from a different perspective. Matthew, we already know he's a tax collector. And you can read it from every perspective. So, so I went back to understand why, why? But, but, but to really, really understand and to kind of kick this sermon off and just kind of go in the direction, I'll give you a story first before I go into the real story. There was a gentleman who, uh, uh, Christmas was coming up, and he bought his wife a diamond ring for Christmas. And she opens it up, and she's like, oh, my God, I got a diamond ring. You know? And she was happy, yeah, whatever, right? But then his best friend was right there, and his best friend kind of pulls him out and said, hey, you told me that your wife wanted a four-wheeler. He's like, yeah, she really did. She goes, but I couldn't find a fake four-wheeler. <laughs> oh, you got it. 915 was a little bit like, yeah. You got it. He said, I couldn't find a fake four-wheeler. And this is exactly what is happening here today, church. Let me tell you why. Because it's possible, it's possible to get by with an imitation gift. It's possible to give someone something that you think is real, that you say it's real, but it really isn't real. It's possible, especially now in the day of knockoffs, I mean, you can make everything look real and look fake. Everything, everything looks like that. But here's the thing. We can't do that with Jesus when it comes to following him. We can't say, Lord, I'll follow you guys and I know your heart. You can fool your wife, you can fool your spouse, you can fool your friends, you can post it on Facebook, you can do whatever you want, quote all the scripture you want, talk like a giver, quote all scripture, wear the right lifeline shirt, but God says, I know your heart. You can fool everybody, but you can't fool me. <laughs> no, 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 you can't fool him, you can't, you can't fool him. And, and here, when we read the scripture, it seems obvious it, or I should say, it's really not that obvious. It's actually the contrary. It's really not that obvious what their agendas were of these three men. We know their statements. We know their comments. But do we really know their hearts? No, we don't. But we serve a God who is Jesus, who knows the heart of men. Who, who when you read further scripture in different stories, the Bible quote says he knew what they were thinking. Another version of another story says he knew what was in their hearts. So before you think that you can just follow anything or anyone, shouldn't you follow the one that his thoughts and ways are higher than your thoughts and your ways in Jesus' name? It's obvious. So when we break down these men, we don't see it off the bat. Because we don't know their hearts. So you got to study to find it. First guy that just came up to Jesus, he says, I'll follow you wherever you go. Sounds great. But who was this man? We're reading out of Luke, but you'd have to go to Matthew 8, 19 to understand who he was. This man was a scribe. He was a scribe. Pastor, what's a scribe? I'm glad you asked. A scribe basically is a highly educated man who worked uh, with men of position and power. I mean, this guy was important. This guy, you know, was up here in, in, in the food hierarchy, you know, in the food chain. He's up here. He knew, he knew the, the people of power. He was a person of power. He was a person of position. He was a person of popularity. In fact, this type of man, this scribe, he's the type of man that would actually write things down. He was a note taker. He would take uh, notes of any meeting, any special, any specific, or any important type of meeting. In fact, he'd be the type that would observe all the different things that Jesus was doing, the scripture, and how the scripture was being copied, and how the scripture was being observed, and God's word. And this man, literally, before he comes to Jesus, you can read it in Matthew, before he comes to Jesus and have an exchange with him, telling him, hey, I'll follow you wherever you go, He's already seen Jesus. He's already seen Jesus perform a number of miracles. In fact, right before th th this, this confrontation or this, or this meeting, the Bible says that Jesus was trying to cast out a demon out of a young boy that the disciples couldn't do and the scribe witnessed it all. 
He witnessed it all. And, and, and to the point where, where we're like I said, a lot of people have been talking about Jesus. He's the Messiah, so on and so forth. This is guy, this is Jesus Christ, the star. I mean, this is the man, this is the myth, this is the legend. He's done miracles. And this guy has checked it out. He's seen him, he's following him. Who wouldn't want to be a part of Jesus? Who wouldn't want to be a part of Jesus? Who wouldn't want to be a part of Jesus with all those miracles and all that fame and all that popularity? Who would want to be? Because isn't it amazing, church, that when you have nothing, no one follows you, but the moment you're blessed, everybody wants to be around you. And that's something. And this man says, I just, I, I'll follow this guy because, man, with this guy, I'll be, I, I'll be blessed. I know that I'll, you know, whatever. And Jesus turns around and he answers me and says, look. He says, foxes have dens and birds have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Basically, what he was saying is that I know what you're looking for, bro. You're looking for popularity. You're looking for your Instagram to go viral. You're looking to be this person that you're really, really not. You're looking at, he says, but if you follow me, you may not even have a place to sleep. Jesus knew his heart. We get to the second guy. The second guy wasn't a scribe. But what he answered tells us of his condition. Second guy says, hey, I'll follow you, Jesus. But let me go bury my dad first. You got to understand burial customs. You see, today in modern science, as soon as the body passes away, you have some time. And with modern science, you can actually uh, prepare a body. And you can wait a week. I've seen a funeral go up to a week and a half before you actually have a funeral. You can prepare the body and it'll last. It'll preserve. But back in those days, church, watch. Back in those days, the moment that a body died, it was literally instant where they would try to preserve the body, do whatever it took so that it would avoid decomposition, so that it wouldn't smell so fast so quick. So when this man says, let me go bury, the, let me go bury my father first, Jesus is probably more saying, if you really had a funeral to attend to, what are you doing here? We can't fool God, church. We can't fool him. Let's say maybe his father was terminally ill. Let's say maybe he was about to die and he's not really dead. Let's say that maybe just some things are going insane. Let me just wait until he passes and then I'll follow you. If he only understood that without making that but statement, that what if statement, if he said, Lord, I'll follow you right now even if my dad is terminally ill, maybe the Lord would have resurrected his father in Jesus' name. Shouldn't he be at a funeral? Jesus probably, what's this guy doing here? Yeah, so Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. It also has some spiritual annotation to it, and I'm not going to get a connotation to that. I'm not going to get into it right now. But then comes the third guy. Third guy's a little bit different. The third guy's response seems a little bit more reasonable. He simply says, hey, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go, but, since there always be a but, let me go say bye to my family first. I'm sorry, Jesus, can you text them? Let me go, Jesus, let me just go say bye to my family first. I mean, it seems like a reasonable thing to do, but you got to remember one thing, church. Jesus isn't speaking to these men's statements more than he's speaking to their intent. Church, we talk too much. We talk too much and we say what we're going to do and we're going to do this and I'm going to be a better dad. And, and, that, and Jesus just wants action. Don't say anything. Just, 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 just walk the walk. Don't talk the talk. But we have so many of us that talk too much and we talk too much and we talk overboard to the point that sometimes it gets us in trouble. Jesus knew his intent. Basically what he's, this guy was saying, he was saying, I'm going to go home and say bye to my family, but I'll be back. Basically what he was saying, he was saying, I'm not coming back. Kind of like that person that you invited to church and they say, I'll be there. Anybody? You invite somebody, they're like, yeah, yeah. you kind of, not, not, you kind of, hey man, you know, just, just come to church. Gonna, yeah, man, what time? 9, 15, 11, man, sh that's awesome. I'll go to all three. <laughs> I didn't even come to one. You know why? Because when you don't want to do something, any excuse will do. 
and we have excuses why we don't pray and we have excuses why we don't read the word and we have excuses for all of this but the moment hell comes and shakes the hell by the foundation and we're freaking out and our marriage is falling apart and we don't know what the hell's going on with the kids who the hell is this kid it looks like he's demon possessed what the heck is going on then all of a sudden we want to make time with the savior we want to make time with god we want to go back to the word and read the he says if you would learn to follow me now if you would give up whatever you have now Jesus simply, simply said, it's no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back. It's fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Basically what he's saying, if you don't understand this, you see, this is the time of agriculture. This is an agricultural age. So Jesus Christ is talking to people of agriculture. He understands that. They understand that. We may not understand it because we don't understand agriculture unless I have some farmers in here. But basically what he's saying, he said, those that are on the plow, you're working the plow. And you're the plow, for those of you that don't know, the plow is a straight line. You got to stay straight. And he says, and looks back. This is not fit for service. Do you know why? Because the moment you get out of line, the harvest is ruined. The pattern of how things are supposed to grow are ruined. So he says, don't look back. He says, if you're trying to go back to your family, really? No, and if you would serve me, I'll take care of your family. Stop looking back to the past. How many times do we keep looking back? How many times have we told the Lord, Lord, I would serve you, but if. I would do this, but if. I would go here, if that bunch of excuses it's amazing we have so many excuses excuses are like butts everybody has them and they all stink church every, i mean i can't wait for january ben's here ben's got me i can't wait to january you go to the gym everybody's there near me everybody wants to be fit but nobody wants to work out Everybody wants to be able to cast demons and have peace in their marriage. And, but nobody wants to put the, the knees to the ground, raise their hands up in the air and say, Lord, I'll follow you whatever you do. I wonder if there's anybody here that knows what I'm talking about. Interesting. Can I go deeper? There's a picture here of this gentleman. His name is Albert Lasker. You probably don't know him. He's already dead. But uh, when he was alive, he was raised in Galveston. His father owned many banks. This man was, an, was iconic when it came to advertising. He was just creative when it came to advertising. And the story goes to say that this man got one of his top executives. He got one of his top executives. And he says, hey, man, I need you to do something for me. He goes, yes, sir. He said, we're in California, our business is booming, we're moving it to New York. We're gonna, we want to have two, two different things, but I want you to move to New York. He says, I can't do it, sir. He's like, well, you're my top executive. He said, yeah, I can't do it. So Albert kind of thought about it, and he says, man, that's kind of weak. He's my top guy, he won't even do it. I'll wait a few weeks, and I'll change it up a bit. So he changes it up a week, and he comes back about four weeks later. And he says, hey, uh, uh, can you sit down? He goes, yeah, what's going on? He goes, I I'm, I've just made my will. I just made my will. He's like, and whenever the time comes, I want you to know that I'm leaving you in charge of this company. He's like, yes, really? Yes. He's like, awesome. He says, will you do me a favor and run it strong? He goes, yes, sir. Would you do me a favor and move it to New York and run it? He goes, yes, sir. He goes, are you sure you'll move it to New York? Yes. He says, really? He goes, yeah. He says, because you're willing to do it when I die, but you're not willing to do it when I'm alive. And that's the God that we serve. We talk too much, church. We talk too much but our action shows and this Christmas could be a best Christmas ever. Not because of what you think you can bring or not what you think you can give, but God says, I can give you my life today, Lord. I want to follow you like I've never followed you before. Maybe your spouse is not there on your lip and I said, I'm going to still show up to church if my husband don't come. My wife may be going crazy, but I'm still coming to church. My kids may be a little bit lost, but I'm still coming to church. I'm not no part-time Christian. I'm not talking about casual Christians. I'm talking about those Christians that said, I'll come to church in season out of season i'll follow you with my family or without my family i'll follow you in sickness and in health i'll follow you through thick and thin i'll follow you through the desert i'll follow you through divorce i'll follow you through bankruptcy i'll do what james 1 22 says that i am a doer and not a walker i wonder if there's anybody
the altar and you worship him and offer him a minch of praise right now, let me just talk to those that don't have Jesus as their personal savior. You say, I want to commit. I want to start something. something new. Just repeat this after me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I am a sinner, but you are my savior. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I choose to follow you today. Thank you, Lord, for erasing my past and giving me a future. Lord Jesus, I choose to follow you. Not the world, not my friends, not even sometimes my own family. I choose to follow you because if I seek ye the first, the kingdom of God, all things will be given unto thee. In Jesus, if you said this prayer, we say amen and we congratulate with you. I wonder if there's anybody here that can shoot their hands up right now and just say this with us. Just sing it with your heart. Sing, my heart will say. There is no other name like Jesus, church. praise offering right there where you're at and say Jesus I choose you tell him I choose you come on give him give him the best praise offering you got there follow me it's time that we become doers of the word and not just talkers church you want to win your friends you want to be there you want to win your family it's not by what you say it's going to be by what you do it's tough at home, praise him. Things are going like crazy, praise him. I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to church. You may not want to go, but I'm going to church. And I'm just telling you that no matter what, I'm going to church. So many people, I'll tell you right now, so many people make plans to miss church when we should make plans not to. And I'm telling you, where you have the Lord is where he has us. It's really simple. It's really simple. I'm just saying that. It's just really simple. I wish I could tell you I had him first in my life all the time, but I didn't. And when I didn't, I suffered. I suffered through things that I shouldn't have had to suffer. So don't be these spiritual cutters that you like to hurt yourself. Let the Holy Spirit do what he needs to do in your life. Follow him. Amen. And if you said the prayer of salvation today, we congratulate you. We celebrate with you. If you're watching us online, you can download our app. It's also, you'll have the videos there. But we want to give you this free book. It's called What's Your Next Step? They're available out there. As well as the playbook. This one is on the Lifestyle Bookstore. It's only $10 today. You're struggling with any form of pain, fear, failure, temptation. This would be a great gift. It's only 10 bucks this uh, December. And next week, church, it's going to be Christmas at Lifeline. It's going to be legit. We're going to crucify.